let's start right now by recalling what we know about reversible versus irreversible processes. And in particular, when we were first thinking about reversible and irreversible processes, we concluded that the heat involved in any reversible process is always going to be larger than the heat for an irreversible process. So that, it turns out, is uh, going to be key to understanding uh, whether processes will be spontaneous or not. Uh, because we know that um, irreversible processes are spontaneous and reversible processes are equilibrium. They're at the nice edge between spontaneous and not spontaneous. The other thing we know is that the Clausius theorem tells us something about reversible heat. Reversible heat divided by temperature is equal to dS. So if reversible heat is always bigger than irreversible heat, dQ over T for a reversible process is always going to be larger than dQ over T over that same temperature for an irreversible process. So that means that uh, in general, either dS is equal to dQ over T if the process is reversible, or it's greater than dQ over T. dS is greater than dQ over T if we have an irreversible process. So I can say dS is always either bigger than or equal to dQ over t, where the greater than sign would apply to any spontaneous process, in other words, any irreversible process, and the equal sign would apply to any equilibrium process. That may seem like a relatively minor change on either the uh, irreversible heat inequality that we've seen before or the Clausius theorem. It's relatively close to that. We've just now got an inequality instead. But notice what this statement says. This is a statement about whether a process is going to be spontaneous or not. If we know whether dS is larger than or smaller than dQ over T, we can tell whether the process is going to be spontaneous or not. And each of these properties, the entropy, the heat, the temperature, those are all statements about the system itself or the heat flowing um, into the system. So those are all statements about the system. They don't involve the surrounding. So we can measure properties of just what's happening in the system and make a conclusion about whether a process is going to be spontaneous or in equilibrium or non-spontaneous. So that's significant, but it's not all that convenient because now we're back to using a path function. Heat is a path function. We'd much rather have this defined in terms of state functions. So in an attempt to get rid of the path function dq, we can go back to the first law. Energy is heat plus work. That'll let us uh, rewrite the heat in terms of some other functions. And in order to get rid of the dW here, let's make an additional assumption. Let's assume we're doing something at constant volume so that there's no PV work. If there's no change in volume, no PV work, then, the, then work is going to be equal to 0. And under those conditions, du will be equal to dq. So then I can rewrite this expression, uh, ds greater than or equal to dq over t. If we're at constant volume and dq is the same thing as du, ds will be greater than or equal to du over t. And now I've got this expression written purely in terms of uh, state variables, entropy, internal energy, temperature, or all state variables. The price I've had to pay is I'm restricting our attention now only to processes at constant volume. So if I rearrange this equation a little bit, bring the t out of the denominator. So I'll say tds is bigger than or equal to du by moving the t over to the left-hand side. I can subtract a du, tds minus du is bigger than or equal to 0 or actually the form that will usually use this if I reverse these, if I take du minus tds instead of the other way around, I've changed the sign of the thing on the left-hand side. So that's going to be, instead of a positive number, it's going to be a negative number. So this is uh, the most significant expression we've got so far on the board. I can make a prediction about whether a process will be spontaneous or not spontaneous. Spontaneous, in equilibrium, or not spontaneous, based on whether the sign of this quantity, du minus tds, is less than 0 for a spontaneous process. 
equal to zero for an equilibrium process? Or if that quantity du minus TDS is positive, then it won't happen. It'll be a non-spontaneous process. So to give you an idea of um, how this works in practice, let's take an example of a process where we can predict without uh, doing any math whether the process is going to be spontaneous or not. And we'll see what this equation says about the same process. What, and the process we'll consider is the melting of ice, solid water turning into liquid water. And we know whether that's spontaneous or not. If we know one additional piece of information, solid ice will melt and form liquid water if the temperature is above the boiling point. It will stay frozen. It will not be spontaneous to melt if the temperature is below the boiling point. So we can ask that question. Uh, so we can ask, is this spontaneous or not? At a variety of different temperatures, we can do it at negative 10 Celsius. We'll do it also at zero degrees Celsius. And we'll do it also at positive 10 degrees Celsius. So we ought to expect it. In fact, I think we'll do these in a different order. We ought to expect it to be spontaneous above the uh, melting point, in equilibrium at the melting point, and uh, non-spontaneous below the melting point. The other information I have to give you in order for us to solve this problem is the values of du and ds. So the change for a mole of water when I uh, melt a mole of water, that entropy of fusion for water is a value we can look up. That's 22.1 joules per mole Kelvin. Likewise, there's a change in the energy when water melts and becomes liquid. That change in the energy is 6.04 kilojoules per mole. Or to get the units the same, 6,040 joules per mole. So there's all the information. Now we can begin answering the question. Let's start actually with this third case where we know it's going to be spontaneous. If I want to know whether water is going to spontaneously melt at this temperature, all I have to ask is what is the sign of the change in the energy minus T times the change in the entropy. I've got this written here in terms of du's, differentials. But if I, as long as the temperature is remaining constant while that ice is melting, I can turn those d's into deltas. Essentially, I just integrated du to become delta u, ds to become delta s. So in, at 10 degrees C, delta u minus t delta s. If I've got, so I've given you the entropy of fusion and the energy of fusion per mole, the molar entropy, the molar energy of fusion. Let's imagine we have one mole of water and we want to know whether it will melt or not. The en energy change will be the molar energy uh, change multiplied by the number of moles. So 6,040 joules per mole times one mole, that would be 6,040 joules. I want to subtract from that the temperature. So in this case, above the melting point, 10 degrees Celsius or uh, 283 Kelvin. So I'm going to subtract 283 Kelvin times the entropy of this process. So the entropy of melting, the entropy of fusion, is 22.1 joules per mole Kelvin times one mole. So 22.1 joules per Kelvin. Kelvin cancels Kelvin. Joules and joules are the same as they should be. So this process, 60, 40 joules, this product is 6250 joules. So I've written that intermediate step out to show you that the T delta S product, that's a larger number than the delta U. I'm subtracting this large number from a smaller number. The result is negative, negative 210 joules. So what have we learned from that? If delta U minus T delta S is a negative number, that means the process is spontaneous. As we expected, we know that water melts above 273 Kelvin, above its, boiling, its melting point of, of uh, zero degrees Celsius. So we expected that that should turn out to be a spontaneous process. If we consider one of the different cases, let's do the one below the melting point. Very similar calculation. 
at negative 10 Celsius or 263 Kelvin, I need the energy of fusion minus the temperature of 263 times the entropy of fusion. Now, since the temperature has changed, the second term has changed also. 263 times 22.1, that number is 5810. So now I have a larger number, 6,000 odd joules, minus a smaller number, 5,800 and some uh, joules, not Kelvin. Should have been more explicit with my units. Kelvins cancel, and I'm left with just joules. So that difference is positive 200 and some joules. So again, what does that mean? The fact that energy minus T delta S is a positive number. If it were negative, it would be a spontaneous process. If it were equal to zero, that's in equilibrium. It's neither of those cases. So, that, so what this equation says is that process won't happen. It's a non-spontaneous process. So what we've learned, although we knew it already, is for case A, at negative 10 degrees Celsius, below the melting point, water does not spontaneously melt. And we can predict that by knowing the energy and the entropy of fusion. And just to complete the third case, which was case B, the details of which won't surprise you at this point. So if I take 60, 40 joules minus and here, in order to get them to cancel, I need to do this at exactly zero degrees Celsius, so 273.15 Kelvin. That product, 273.15 Kelvin multiplying 22.1 joules, that'll give me 6040. So if I ask whether ice will melt and form liquid water at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius at its melting point. That difference delta U minus T delta S, that comes out to exactly zero, which means the process is in equilibrium. So that means solid water, liquid water are in equilibrium with each other. I can have both of them existing, converting back and forth between each other at this temperature of zero Kelvin. So, these numerical results are not a surprise. They match what we already know about water. The significant result is now that we uh, have a way of predicting, even for cases where we don't know the answer already, we have quantities that we can evaluate just for the system. I didn't have to ask questions about the surroundings, what kind of container the water was in, whether it was isolated or not. All I had to know was that I was doing that process at constant volume, and I used the energy, temperature, and entropy of that process in order to make a prediction about whether the process is spontaneous or not. Uh, so clearly that's a useful thing to be able to do. So this quantity delta U minus T delta S is going to turn out to be fairly important. So our next step is going to be uh, to explore that quantity a little more.